a diplomatic blow. Nauru cuts ties with Taiwan, leaving Taipei with just 12 allies. Saturday's election has left Taiwan's next legislature divided. What does that mean for President-elect Lai ching -te? He was known as Taiwan's Nelson Mandela. We pay tribute to democracy leader Shi ming -te, who died at the age of 83. Plus, the favorite tile game helping battle a growing dementia problem. A warm welcome to Taiwan Plus News. Thanks for joining me on this latest edition. I'm Leslie Liao. There's disappointment for all three of Taiwan's big political parties over the results of Saturday's election. No party won a legislative majority. John Van Triest has this story. For Taiwan's biggest opposition party, it's a time to reflect on what went wrong. Though the Kuomintang, or KMT, made big gains in the legislature, it failed to win a majority in Saturday's election. It also failed to win the presidency, giving the ruling Democratic Progressive Party a historic third term. As the party's presidential candidate, Ho yo -i, bows out and leaves the stage, some KMT supporters are now finger-pointing. Their target is party chair Eric Zhu. But the KMT isn't the only party reflecting. The Taiwan People's Party is also thinking about how to move forward. This emerging party still wants to be a viable third force in Taiwan's politics, breaking the two-party system. It did pick up some seats in the legislature, but these were all special seats that don't have a fixed district. In every regional race, its candidates lost. And even the DPP, with its unprecedented third presidential term in a row, is disappointed. It only won the presidency with 40 percent of the vote. And it lost its legislative majority. Taiwan is set to have no majority in its one-chamber legislature for the first time in 20 years. Analysts say the DPP also has some hard thinking to do. With no party winning a resounding mandate, it's also time to see whether these three blocs can build coalitions or whether Taiwan will face political stalemate. James Lin and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. For a look at what the results of the legislative election mean, John Van Trieste spoke to Zhang Hongling of NGO Citizen Congress Watch. What do you make of the results of this election? And why do you think that none of the parties involved got a majority in the legislature? what impact do you think the results of this election are going to have on President-elect Lai ching political agenda? What do you see as the Taiwan People's Party's next step? The party was founded to give Taiwan's voters a third choice besides the two traditional parties. Do you think the party is now going to stick to that and cause trouble, or do you think it will find an alliance in one of the major parties? Now 
Once again, that was Zhang Hongling of NGO Citizen Congress Watch speaking to our reporter John Van Trieste. The Pacific Island nation of Nauru has announced it's cutting ties with Taiwan and recognizing China. The move leaves Taiwan with just 12 diplomatic allies. Louise Watt is live for us outside the foreign ministry in Taipei. Louise, how is Taiwan responding to this news? Taiwan is responding strongly to this. Within an hour of Nauru's announcement, Taiwan called a press conference here in the foreign ministry where it announced that it was removing its staff from its embassy in Nauru and asking Nauru to close its embassy here in Taipei. And actually this evening I've just seen the Nauru ambassador leave the foreign ministry here. Now at the press conference a few hours earlier, Taiwan, Taiwan's deputy foreign minister accused China of luring a away in Nauru with money and it said that what China's intention is is to crush democracy. The key thing about the timing of this announcement is it's just two days since Taiwan held critical elections where they where the result was Taiwan's ruling party's presidential candidate Lai Ching-de he won. Now he is just the man that Beijing did not want to see win the presidency and in fact in the run-up to Taiwan's elections Beijing Beijing effectively said a vote for Lai would be a vote for war. Is this lightest loss for Taiwan looking at the country's overall diplomatic situation? So Nauru is not a big country. It doesn't punch above its weight on the world stage. In fact, none of or hardly any of, of Taiwan's allies do. But that said, the loss of Nauru is not a good look for Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan has now lost 10 allies since President Tsai Ing-wen came to power in 2016. So the allies have effect, they've essentially halved since she came to power. However, what Taiwan's government would say is that in that time, Taiwan has strengthened relations with the United States and Japan, which are not Taiwan's official allies, but they are critical to Taiwan's security. So the latest loss, it does suggest that Beijing will increase the pressure on Taiwan even before Lai takes office in May. Will Taiwan lose more allies before then? Well, a senior, office, a senior official here at Taiwan's foreign minister has told me that they are confident they believe Taiwan's allies, in his words, won't fall into the trap of China. Thank you, Louise, for that report from outside Taiwan's foreign ministry. To dig deeper into what the loss of relations with Nauru means for Taiwan, our reporter Joyce Tseng spoke with Yan Zhenzhen, a professor of international affairs at National Zhengzi University. Now that Nauru has broken diplomatic ties, Taiwan is at a historic glow with just 12 allies. How big of an impact does Nauru leaving have on Taiwan's foreign affairs? Uh, a, a country like Nauru, so small in the Pacific Island, probably can be explained away, but this will not be able to explain the, away the fact that we have lost 10 diplomatic allies since Tsai Ing-wen took office and since Lai ching -de already pledged to continue to toy the line of Tsai Ing-wen. I don't think there will be any dialogue or interaction with Beijing. We will continue to lose diplomatic ally. But I didn't expect it come so fast. In just a few hours later, you learn about Nauru. But this, I think, is what China has worked on before the election, uh, but just waiting for the result of the election. So it can, you know, use that to uh, maybe making a statement about, uh, you know, the, the, the reaction of Beijing is a continuation of poaching Taiwan's diplomatic ally since uh, we have elected a DPP government. China has been trying to increase its influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Do you think China establishing ties with Nauru shows Beijing's strategic interests there, or is it really just about Taiwan? I don't know whether China is trying you know, to make a statement of just like they are trying to uh, uh, get uh, Switzerland or Eswatini to their side so that have, you know, a complete sweep of the African continent. Do they have complete sweep of the Pacific Island in mind? I'm not sure. But strategically, Nauru is not as important, but 
the more important thing is uh, it does uh, represent uh, that Australia, the country, the, the power in the region uh, cannot stop or cannot keep uh, the Pacific Island country from moving to Beijing side, just like the U.S. cannot stop the Latin American uh, ally of Taiwan to switch uh, diplomatic recognition. You mentioned Taiwan losing many of its allies under DPP presidencies. And now that Lai ching has secured a historic third straight term for the party, what do you see being the worst case scenario for Taiwan's diplomatic relations? Worst case scenario is we will have probably a single digit of diplomatic allies. Our government has, to me, they have anticipated this. So in the past few years, I can see that we have uh, uh, moved on to, to more important uh, substantial relation with non-diplomatic allies. But without the diplomatic allies uh, in the Caribbean or Central America, uh, our president cannot even have a transit stop in the U.S then we would truly be isolated. That was Joyce Zeng speaking with Yan Zhengsun, international affairs professor at National Zhengzhi University. China has officially reacted to the de- election of DPP candidate Lai Qingde as Taiwan's next president. But as Rosie Gwenninger explains, some people in China are hopeful for peaceful cross-strait relations. Two days since Taiwan elected Lai Qingde of the Democratic Progressive Party to rule the nation, China is reaffirming its claim on the country. Avoiding taking aim directly at the DPP, which is taking an unprecedented third term in power, Beijing is warning Taiwan not to push for independence, saying its one China principle is a solid anchor for peace across the Taiwan Strait. Taiwan but on the streets of Shanghai and Hong Kong, more optimistic views of collaboration. <laughs> Taiwan depends heavily on trade with China, and Lai has been making efforts to soften his earlier stance for independence, knowing he has to find a way to work with the country's cross strait neighbour without upsetting the status quo. I think uh, uh, the, uh, basically the uh, 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 policy, foreign policy, cross strait relations will remain the same. But it, it very much depends upon Xi Jinping's attitude, I would say. But with President-elect Lai, Beijing's least preferred choice, vowing to safeguard Taiwan's democracy, the Chinese leader's attitude towards the island nation may not be so diplomatic. Ryan Wu and Rosie Greninger for Taiwan Plus. Coming up, with year-long conscription about to resume, Taiwan prepares to overhaul its training for young men. Stay tuned. Taiwan and around the world, download the Taiwan Plus app. At Connected, we believe in the power of dialogue. It's not just about the headlines, it's about finding common ground. Join the conversation. 
Connected with Divya Gopalan on Taiwan Plus. Welcome back. You're watching Taiwan Plus News. Prominent democracy leader Shi Mingde has died aged 83 after years of battling cancer. Known as Taiwan's Nelson Mandela, Shi spent over a quarter of his life in prison for defying Taiwan's authoritarian Kuomintang regime. Shi served one term as the Democratic Progressive Party's chair. He later split from the party in protest of corruption in the government of then-President Chen Shui-bian. Shi leaves behind a legacy as one of Taiwan's most prominent fighters for freedom, equality, and human rights. To discuss Shi's activism and his role in pushing for Taiwanese democracy, our reporter Joyce Zeng spoke with research fellow Paul Huang from the Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation. What are some important moments from Shi Mingde's activism that people will remember? He was the one, you know, that that participated in pretty much all the important uh, moments in Taiwan's democracy democratization. And as the DPP chairperson, he was the one that really modernized the DPP. She led a, led a huge protest movement in 2005 and onwards and against the Chen Shui-bian. The, the, the then president of the Taiwan and uh, who was uh, involved in this uh, corruption scandals. After that, the DPP never really forgave Xi. But that's what democracy is. If your party is, uh, is found to be corrupt and incompetent, and you lose the poor and people will vote you out. So I think that Xi was, uh, he follows through the examples and the ideas that he had, and he never gave it up. The world has been talking about Taiwan's elections and some calling it a celebration of democracy. Do you think Shi would be proud of the current state of Taiwanese politics? We don't know if he if he had read, if he was like before he died today, if he ever read or was informed of recent years. But we know that he at the last years of his life, he really was not a fan of DVP. He was not a fan of the opposition party either, but he has uh, always stayed true to himself. He, he sees himself as someone who uphold ideas rather than partisan politics. Shi once called for a united government, especially between the DPP and the KMT. Are there any activists trying to continue Shi's work on that front, especially now that Taiwan faces a DPP presidency and the KMT having the most seats in the legislature? Taiwan politics uh, from... Uh, now and from now on, would just be about partisan politics rather than these revolutionary democratic movement that she kind of represented. The successive government over the last decade and two, they have failed to address the institutional fundamental problems, such as military reforms, such as the economic the stagnation of wages for young people. And, not, and we're not talking even talking about big ideas like what she had. I don't see anyone of that caliber right now. That was Joyce Zhen speaking with Paul Huang, a research fellow at Taiwan Public Opinion Foundation. Taiwan is gearing up to train the first wave of one-year military service conscripts after it was expend, extended from four months. As Jaime Okan reports, these conscripts will see a new type of realistic training. Just two weeks into 2024, and Taiwan is stepping up the way it trains soldiers. The military says it's implementing a new realistic shooting drill for the first wave of one-year conscripts who begin training on January 25th. Back in 2022, Taiwan decided to extend mandatory military service to better prepare its soldiers for a potential conflict. Taiwan has been trying to up its defenses against neighboring China, which is threatened to invade. The shooting practice is just one component of the training soldiers on the ground will receive during the newly extended service. This shooting drill is supposed to train soldiers' ability to react. It starts with an 125-meter dash down the shooting range. 
Soldiers then stop to take cover for a few seconds before reaching this shooting barricade. Troops then fire at targets in three positions, lying down, on one knee, and standing. The exercise emphasizes being able to shoot at multiple targets at different angles, and the drill must be completed in under two minutes. This revamped training is supposed to expose soldiers to more shooting scenarios and familiarize themselves with some of the country's different weapon systems. The military hopes that exercises like these will help boost its fighting force and give its soldiers the training they need to defend the country. John Su and Jaime Ocon for Time One Plus. There have been chaotic scenes in Guatemala over the inauguration of President-elect Bernardo Arevalo. Protesters and police scuffled after the inauguration was delayed by Congress for several hours. Arevalo won the election in August, but his swearing-in has seen legal attacks from Congress over the past several months. Guatemala is one of Taiwan's 12 remaining diplomatic allies, and Foreign Minister Joseph Wu is in the country to attend the inauguration. North Korea has fired a hypersonic missile the first time it has ever done so. State media says the launch tested new solid fuel engines and a more maneuverable warhead. Pyongyang says it did not pose a threat to neighboring countries. The test took place on the same day the North's foreign minister left on a visit to Russia. Pyongyang and Moscow are strengthening military relations with the North suspected of providing missiles to Russia to use in its war in Ukraine. A volcano has sent lava flowing into a town in Iceland, setting houses on fire. The lava flow started pouring into the fishing town of Grindavik after two nearby fissures opened. The whole town has been evacuated and there are no reported casualties. It's the second time the volcano has erupted in less than a month. An ancient game is showing up in Taiwan's care homes. Laurel Stewart reports on how mahjong can help fight dementia. <laughs> A game of strategy and skill. Residents in this care home in Taipei are playing mahjong, despite not quite remembering how. It's part of a drive to help people with dementia interact with others while keeping their minds active. The care home called for students and healthy people over the age of 65 to play mahjong with residents. They had expected to take on three or four volunteers, but were overwhelmed by over 2,000 applications. Doctors say games like mahjong and chess help delay or even prevent dementia because they're interactive and stimulate the brain. The care home is encouraging residents to play other board games with volunteers too, to help with recognizing colors, shapes and textures. And it's a partnership that's sharing joy across generations. Taiwan has an aging population, which means memory impairment and cognitive decline is likely to become more prevalent. About one in 13 people over 65 and one in five over the age of 80 here have dementia. Despite mahjong traditionally being played for gambling, its use of tiles instead of cards makes it easier for seniors to play. As staying active and social gets more important in old age, this centuries-old game could be a vital tool in keeping seniors sharp. Alex Chen and Laurel Stewart for Taiwan Plus. Travelers to southeast Taiwan may be surprised to find an airport arrival hall filled with unique furnishings. These are the result of a unique collaboration between student carpenters and the local forestry department. Bryn Thomas takes a look. Believe it or not, this is a transport hub, not a furniture showroom. This exhibit at Taidong Airport in southeast Taiwan showcases both the ingenuity of Taiwan's youth and the artistic traditions of its indigenous minorities, all while giving people a unique spot to rest from their travels. Uh, 
The exhibit is a result of an exchange between a Taidong vocational school and the local environmental department. Driftwood, collected from Taiwan's beaches, is passed on to students, giving them a unique chance to apply their skills to recovered local materials. Many of the student carpenters belong to Taiwan's indigenous communities. Their unique cultural traditions are reflected in each piece, increasing the visibility of the country's minority groups. In addition to providing a venue for indigenous arts and crafts, the exhibit also puts carpentry students in contact with potential customers. Project organizers hope that by giving students a chance to show off their abilities, they'll give them a few money-making opportunities after they graduate. Leon Lian and Bryn Thomas for Taiwan Plus. That's it for this edition of Taiwan Plus. Finally today, we leave you with images of the Nasata Light Festival kicking off in Thailand's Ratchaburi province. I'm Leslie Liao. Take care, and I'll see you next time.